What would happen if you combined Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, George Orwell's 1984, Pierce Brown's Red Rising, Robert Jackson Bennett's Divine Cities, Stephen Erickson's Book of the Malazan, and Diana Wynne Jones's The Dark Lord of Dirkholm, all in a blender set to puree speed. You'd get something resembling Matthew Woodring Stover's insanely epic 1998 novel, Heroes Die. I'm Bridger, and welcome to the Library Ladder. At first glance, Heroes Die looks like a book you might want to steer clear of. The cover conveys a certain je ne sais quoi vibe that doesn't exactly inspire confidence in the book's contents. But don't let the cover put you off. This is a book unlike any other I've ever read. Or rather, it's like a lot of very different books all melded into an exhilarating amalgam of styles, themes, action, and intrigue. I can only imagine the pitch Stover's literary agent might have made to Delray Books to convince them to publish it. It might have gone something along the lines of, Imagine assassin extraordinaire Jason Bourne as a television reality star who is sent by his corporate overlords to Middle Earth to assassinate the Gondorian heir and create a succession war, and then to destabilize the other kingdoms of men and elves all in the name of keeping TV ratings high. Oh, and finally, to destroy or capture the Dark Lord Sauron so his immortal powers of the Maiar can be used by Hollywood to solidify its position as the most potent industrial and political power on Earth. Or, if that's a little too high concept for you, what if we crossed the firemen from Fahrenheit 451 with, um, Logan Nine Fingers from Joe Abercrombie's First Law series. I should note that those references to other works and characters are just analogies to what's actually in the book. But it sounds pretty bonkers, right? Well, it is. And it isn't. Stover does a remarkable job grounding what should be an utterly absurd tale within a narrative of unusual complexity and emotional and thematic depth. Heroes Die has a dualistic aspect to it because it's almost like two books in one. On the one hand, it's a science fiction story set in our world in a not too distant dystopian future where giant corporate and industrial conglomerates wield absolute power over a highly stratified society. Books are outlawed, independent thought is strongly discouraged, and freedom of expression is effectively prohibited and punished harshly. It's a caste system in which the teeming multitudes exist to serve the elites and are kept dumb and submissive by their addiction to televised entertainments. It's the bread and circuses of ancient Rome all over again. The most popular TV shows are those set in a fantasy world known as Otherland. The lead actors in the shows play the parts of warriors, mages, thieves, elves, dwarves, and others. And the most popular character from the shows is a ruthless mercenary assassin named Kane, played by actor Hari Michelson. Hari is a once downtrodden member of a lower caste who, through skill, tenacity, and a strong vicious streak, has risen as high as he can hope to in Earth's highly restrictive pecking order. But now, he's having second thoughts about the morality of his career, and he wants to retire. You see, Otherland isn't a fictional creation of Hollywood. Instead, it's a real place, connected to Earth by a trans-dimensional wormhole device that can teleport Hari and the other actors to Otherland while maintaining a continuous video, audio, and data uplink to Earth so the viewers back home can experience it in immersive virtual reality like glory and gore. When Hari kills the inhabitants of Otherland in his role as Cain, the legendary assassin, he really does kill them. And every mission Hari undertakes on the show could be his last because he risks being killed himself. Most of the actors on the shows are much like the gladiators of ancient Rome trained to be ruthless and trying to prolong their lives as long as possible and by whatever means necessary. Cain the Assassin is a brutal, atavistic killing machine. He's Rambo, Dutch, the man with no name, 
the bride. Rama and John Wick all rolled up into one. But actor Hari Michelson is something different. Deep down, Hari has a conscience and a very sharp intellect, courtesy of the education he received from his father, who once was an academic, and who studied history and political philosophy before those subjects were outlawed. Prevented from retiring, Hari is coerced by his ambitiously slippery corporate bosses to take on a final blockbuster mission to Otherland to rescue his estranged wife, who is also an actor, and who has disappeared while on a mysterious top-secret mission. At this point in the book, the story becomes a very different one once Hari's alter ego, Kane, arrives in Otherland. It shifts from a dystopian science fiction story to a grimdark epic fantasy story, complete with blades, magical spells and artifacts, elder gods, sacrificial blood rites, and incredible battle scenes. It's worth noting that Stover is a martial arts expert, so his descriptions of fights and hand-to-hand -hand combat feel authentic and very visceral. And by describing this book as grimdark, I don't mean the ultra-dark and bleak nihilism of a lot of such fantasy these days. Yes, Heroes Die is dark and violent and bloody, and there's no shortage of dishonorable characters in it. However, the book has a lot of heart, as it explores themes of love and sacrifice and family ties, and greed, power, and our cultural fascination with violent entertainment. The story also takes on some of the trappings of both a mystery novel and a spy thriller, as Kane and Hari attempt on both worlds to unravel the puzzle of his wife's disappearance and to plant the seeds of a popular revolution against the powers that be who rule each world with an iron fist. The two worlds, Earth and Otherland, are a study in contrasts and similarities. One world is an advanced technological society with many of the hallmarks of a fascist surveillance state, while the other world is straight out of the Hyborian age of Robert E. Howard, and yet trust is in short supply there as well due to the omnipresent activities of spies, informants, and double agents. Both worlds are cautionary tales of what can happen when creative freedom is stifled and replaced by the desire of authoritarian rulers to exert oppressive control over their domains. Plots, hidden agendas, intrigue, and betrayals are endemic among the rich and powerful in both worlds. And to paraphrase Howard Beale from the 1976 film Network, both Hari and Kane in their different personas are mad as hell, and they aren't going to take it anymore in either world. He's no longer just a Hollywood gladiator. He's Spartacus. I also want to say that the dual aspect of the Hari and Kane personas makes him a very nuanced and well-drawn character. He's highly conflicted. He wants to reject violence, but at the same time, violence is the one talent that he excels at and that sets him apart from others and makes him a celebrity. Also, his relationships with others, including his wife, are complicated, as befits a man who truly believes in the ideals of love, loyalty, and liberty, but is capable of sacrificing all three in bouts of rage and violent excess. Stover's writing style was, to me, surprisingly good. It's polished and engaging and incredibly well-paced, Although the first 50 pages or so are a little sluggish, as Stover establishes the background setting and introduces aspects of Earth's corporate hegemony, the pace quickly accelerates once Hari accepts his final mission to Otherland. In fact, to quote heavy metal legend Spinal Tap, the story gets cranked up to 11, and it stays at that frenetic pace for most of the book, culminating in a grand climax that is both a literal and figurative apotheosis. It's exhausting in a very good way. Moreover, Stover does some very clever things with his writing style. When the setting shifts from Earth to Otherland, the narrative voice also shifts. The parts of the book set on Earth are written in a traditional third-person voice. But once the setting shifts to Otherland, we get to experience Kane's narration from a first-person present-tense perspective. It's a neat trick that Stover pulls off. 
Kane's extended first-person interior monologues are a plot device expressly required by his TV show producers to maintain a running narrative explanation of his thoughts and actions for the audiences back on Earth. And it makes us readers feel as if we're part of his audience too, watching his performance in real time through a virtual reality headset. The world building in the book is equally impressive, with most of the attention focused on the fantasy world of Otherland. It's a seedy, somewhat disreputable place that reminded me a lot of China Mieville's New Crovazon. Heroes Die is actually the first in a four-book series known as The Acts of Cain, but it can be read as a standalone novel without any difficulty. The second book in the series, The Blade of Taishao, focuses more on the corporate and political machinations back on Earth, and it is very different in tone, pacing, and structure. I enjoyed it, but not nearly as much as the first book. In closing, I just want to say that Heroes Die really shouldn't work. It tries to do too much. It combines too many elements from different genres, different narrative voices, and different emotional beats and themes. And it juggles all of those things at breakneck speed, never letting up on its wild ride. Nevertheless, it does work. And more than that, it succeeds brilliantly. Thus, it's no surprise to me that authors Steven Erickson, Scott Lynch, and Pierce Brown have all credited Heroes Die with inspiring their own well-known literary creations. I hope you enjoyed this review. I had originally planned to upload a video discussing the many works of author Neil Stevenson, but it's taking a little longer than I had planned to get that one done. Wanting to get a new video out this week, I pivoted to make this one instead. If you're looking forward to the Stevenson video, I hope to have it finished soon. Thanks for your patience, and thanks for watching.